Appreciate it, man. Hi, everyone. Um, first off, I just want to thank Derek for giving me this opportunity. Um, we've had a lot of discussions, and I, I also just appreciate his time uh, this past week, kind of meeting with me a couple times just to go over some of this and my brain dumps and my late night emails, so I appreciate it. Um, I'm also going to pray before I get into this message. Um, just Lauren, just thank you for this opportunity, and uh, I just pray that you use me to help bring this message um, to everyone to help us all grow in our worship and our, in our discipleship. Um, I just pray that this message just lands in a unique way on everyone's heart. In your name we pray, amen. So uh, like Derek mentioned, I'm uh, landing on worship tonight or teaching on worship tonight. And I just want to first start off with just saying, uh, just asking everyone, what is worship in your guys' eyes? You guys can kind of just shout it out. Singing. Yeah. Anyone else? Praising. Praising. Yes. So worship is a lot of different things. It can be singing and praising. It can be even <laughs> dancing. Um, it can be giving. It can be doing everyday tasks um, for your spouse or just for anyone. You could be serving, communion, pretty much anything that we can do with a joyful heart towards God and that brings joy to God. Also, one of the ones that I gleaned over was, that's not very talk, talked very much in the church, is sex in marriage is also a form of worship. Um, we see these examples in scripture. Uh, first off, I'm going to start with Psalm 100. Um, it's shout for the joy, for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with the joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter the gates with thanksgiving and the courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through the, all generations. We also see worship throughout the Old Testament and New Testament. Um, some examples are in Daniel 3. We see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego not bending the knee to a false idol and they were cast into the fire, but they praised through there and God joined them in that fire. Um, in Joshua six, we see um, the Jericho walls fall out of their shout of praise. And that's a great example that I'm gonna get into later of that private and public forms of worship. They walked around for seven days, that wall praying privately. And at the end on that seventh day, they marched seven times and they shouted out in a shout of praise and blew their trumpets. And that wall came crashing down in God's faithfulness. Um, Paul and Silas singing in the prison in Acts 16. It shows breakthrough and it shows that we don't let our circumstances dictate our worship. They're in some of the most difficult times of their life, but yet they're crying out to God in a, in a worship service, essentially, which leads the Roman guard to being saved and witnessing to them. Uh, we see the woman with the alabaster box in Luke 7 that comes and worships Jesus at her feet. That that's all that she could bring to him, but yet she pours out and surrenders herself to Jesus and cleans his feet with this uh, anointing oil. Uh, we see David dancing in 2 Samuel uh, 6. Um, if everyone remembers Footloose, great movie. Also, we laughed about that verse today. Um, also in Luke and Mark, we see that the widow's might, um, that she gave that last offering that she had, those last coins, and that just showed to Jesus how that sacrificial giving was just an ultimate form of praise in, uh, to him. So the book breaks it down into four different parts. And uh, the first one that I wanna focus on is, uh, worship is focusing on and responding to God. Um, in Revelation 4, let me get to it, um, we see what worship, sorry, excuse me, uh, worship in heaven is like. It's a very long verse, which I won't read the entire thing, but starting in, sorry, in verse 6 of chapter 4 of Revelation, it says, also in front of the throne, there was a, what looked like a sea of glass, clearly as crystal clear as crystal and the center around the throne were four living creatures and they covered and they were covered with eyes in the front and the back the first living creature was like a lion the second was like an ox the third 
had a face like a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and were covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. And day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. I think that that is just such a powerful verse in the sense of what worship in heaven is like. And unfortunately, we can't see God's face yet, but we get to see him and appreciate his infinite worth through the things that he has created for us here on earth. Um, so since we can't see him yet, we get to see glimpses of him in our, his creation. Um, you know, I just, when I was studying this, I, I, I kind of laughed because every single time in the Bible app, you pull up the daily verse, where is always the background, a beautiful scenery, a beach, a mountain, some sort of creation. And you got to realize that that was just one of his forms of worship when Genesis, when he was creating the world, he snapped his fingers and created all this beauty for us to see on day and night and get to see him. And I think that worshiping God is anything that brings on a spontaneous response. Um, just kind of that knee jerk reaction. Um, I picture it also of like you're cresting a mountain and you just get to that overlook and you just think to yourself, wow, like that is the Holy Spirit inside of us pouring out and longing for that beauty of God. And that is a form of worship. And we need to remember that. And in those circumstances, pausing and not immediately pulling out our phones as much as we want to, because the picture never does it justice. How many times have we seen, like shown someone a beautiful landscape and we're like, but the picture doesn't do it justice. It doesn't because that's for our eyes to see right there at that moment. Yes, we get to capture that moment, but at the same time, that's us getting to revel in God's beauty. And God's also revealed himself uh, in three different ways. One, first off, that I just hit on was his creation. The second was the living word that he left us in the Bible. And then the third was his son, Jesus Christ. Um, and then in the, this quote in the chapter was really good to me. It stood out was that the, to the degree that we truly comprehend more of God, we will in turn respond more to him in worship. And I think that that means that the more that we worship privately throughout the week, the more that we want to worship publicly. Um, that we, that, um, Tammy did a really great job last week of teaching us on that coming from that point of overflow and devouring the word and laying it on our hearts and you know using it constantly throughout. And I think that if we equip ourselves with that, then we will want to privately, we will want to publicly pour out into people. Um, and so that's why worship on Sunday is an overflow of our private worship throughout the week. Um, the more that we equip our hearts with script, scriptures and prayer and have a relation with Jesus, the more that we posture our hearts towards praising God. Um, I think that public worship on Sunday also helps us set our posture for receiving the word and the message that is about to be preached. Um, essentially, worship is going to be like tilling up your soil and getting yourself ready to receive the word. And I think that if we're sitting there and we've had a rough week and we haven't been privately worshiping, it's very difficult to sometimes till it up because we do get distracted. And I think that that's where we need to make sure that we focus on that. Um, and that's where also the balance of private worship comes into play is that it's that intake and meditating on the word. Um, as we're doing this, and we have to ask ourselves when we're doing this privately is are we doing it joyfully or are we just, are we distracted? Do we have the TV on the background? Is our phone sitting right there and we're getting emails and text messages and all sorts of notifications? I know that I have that struggle that I actually have to utilize the focus mode or airplane mode when I'm in worship because usually I'm playing music through um, my phone. So, um, and then that's what, you know, the chapter also talks about is not worshiping in vain. And so that's where we need to make sure that he is our, he has our full undivided attention when we're worshiping. Um, and so that's where, you know, we need to make sure of that. And so, um, that leads me to the second point where worship is also needs to be done in spirit and in truth. Um, so John 4.24, let me flip to it really fast. So 
sorry, John 4, 23 and 24. Uh, this is Jesus speaking. He says, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Um, so the Holy Spirit, which we all shouldn't have if we've accepted Jesus Christ into our hearts, is the Holy Spirit works to reveal God to us and awakens our dead hearts to the goodness of God. Um, it helps us to say that Jesus is Lord profoundly and believe it and to witness to people. Um, and so to worship in the Spirit involves worship from the inside out. So just like we talked about last week, the Holy Spirit should overflow out of our heart like a river. This should happen with our worship and uh, that they, that we are so filled that it comes out of us, that we are a, um, a spring instead of a drain, that we are just welling up that uh, sort of worship to the Lord. And just as we worship in the Spirit, we also must be backed by truth. Truth, truth helps us discern if something is godly and worthy of our praise or is it of the world? That's, it gets even more difficult every single day um, in the time that we're living in. This is why we must equip ourselves with the word of God and utilize the Holy Spirit because they will speak to us and let us know if something is of the world versus God-given. Because we have to remember that worship isn't just music. Um, worship can be worshiping your favorite sports team a little too much. Uh, worship can be worshiping your job a little too much, which sometimes I get distracted with as well. Um, worship, you know, you can fall into idolatry of material possessions. So at the same time that we're worshiping things and like, you know, thanking God for things, we need to also think to ourselves, is this back with truth? Is this biblical? Is like what I'm doing... Um, you know, joyful in the eyes of God? Is it bringing him joy? Um, and so when we worship in truth, we are also worshiping all of God. We're worshiping that he is a God of mercy and justice, of love and wrath, that he welcomes us into heaven, but also has the power to cast us down into hell. Um, I think that, you know, it's very difficult in Western Christianity for us to try to cherry pick the God that we want. Um, when unfortunately we get all of him because he wants all of us. So that's what we have to remember uh, day in and day out. And, walk, and just like our worship needs to be a balance between both spirit and in truth. Uh, if you are worshiping in too much spirit, um, it can lead to your emotions taking over and laziness and then it can cause a church to allow too much to be tolerated um which happens in a lot of other churches now and can lead to man-made worship versus spirit-led worship and it can become a circus and more about man versus god um charles spurgeon has a great quote that kind of hit me this week when i was studying all of this it says a time will come when instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, the church will have clowns entertaining the goats. Not saying that Derek is a clown. No. <laughs> um, what I'm saying is we have to be careful of the music that we're listening to because is it backed by biblical truths? Um, you know, there's some songs out there that are questionable lyrics, and that's why we also need to equip ourselves with the, the word of God and say, is this biblical? Is this actually occurring in here um but then also on the other side if you become a little too hesitant and only want to worship in truth it can become rigid worship can be, become very rigid and um if we're afraid to worship god freely we're not giving him our all and that's not what he calls us to do and that can also be dangerous in our church because to non-believers or to visitors or to new people to the faith, it could be seen as dead and they could want something else. So I think that that's where we need to posture our hearts on Sundays from our private stance and worship freely and show them that it is a safe place to be able to worship freely um, on a weekly basis. So in Mark, 
Mark 12, 30. Should we get to that? Um, 12.30, this is God speaking, or this is Jesus speaking again. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. So I think that that's where it should, like he's speaking to um, on the greatest commandment. And I think that that's where we need to remember. And I think it's a great representation as well of that spirit and truth is that it's all of our heart and our mind. It's not a if and either or it's both of them at the same time um he shows us that it's an equal balance between the two and we can be seen as in like i said spirit and truth also when worship is done in spirit and in truth breakthrough can happen which is the restoring of joy and the freedom of worship um just like i was talking about with paul and silas in the in the prison you know they didn't worry about their circumstances they praised through that breakthrough um and then as Paul teaches us, it's a daily battle to carry our cross as Christians. And we are renewed daily. So it's not going to always be ups when following Jesus. Um, I think that as we can see also in the New Testament and throughout Jesus's, um, through the Gospels, we see that Jesus and his disciples went through tough times when doubts crept in. Uh, but they worshiped their way through it and God helped them. I think that we see when Jesus is preparing himself to go to the cross, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and cries out to God in a, in a last-ditch effort for um, in worship. But he worships his way through it. And I think about also, I put myself in the disciples' place, um, you know, in those three days when they were waiting for Jesus to rise and that those doubts and fears crept in, and yet they still when Jesus came back and Thomas got to see the scars on Jesus's hands, he bowed down at his feet and said, holy are you and that you are the true one. And um, I just think that that is just such a beautiful way of showing that breakthrough that like in those valleys, they still continued to pray and make their way out of it. So that raises the question of, do we praise before our breakthrough, i.e. being proactive with our praise? Or are we constantly casting out lifelines or last ditch efforts um, to God when we are going through tough times? Um, I sat there and felt a little convicted when I was reading this because there's a lot of times that, you know, Andrea and I have gone through some tough times and I've cast out those, uh, you know, unexpected lifelines of prayers and everything. And when we get out of the situation, that's when my flesh can sometimes take over and say, man, good, good job, Alex, way to get us out of that situation or, and not saying, thank you, Lord, for getting us out of that situation. And I think that if we worship as hard as we did when we were in the valleys, like we did when we were on the peaks, we would see so much more breakthrough in our lives. So we need to remember that, that even though we pray or like we, we praise in those valleys and like we we need help that like when we're on those peaks, we need to continue to praise and worship and pray to God because he'll continue to move us forward and help us through those situations and equip us through those difficult times. Uh, point number three is um, worship is expected to both be public and private. Um, we're not just a gr group of loners in the church, um, you know, throughout the Bible, we're called the body, we're called, um, you know, we're the people, we're, we're a community. Um, and I think that just because we go on Sundays to church doesn't exempt us from private worship throughout the week. And just because we privately worship throughout the week and meditate on the word, it doesn't exempt us from coming on Sundays. So, and when we worship publicly, we can help pour into others that may be struggling. Um, you know, how many times do we come on Sunday that we may have not had the best week and we say, when someone asks us how we're doing, we say, we're doing great, doing fine, put on that smile, you know, but secretly you're hurting a little bit. So I think that that's what we need to keep in mind that we don't know what others are going through, especially after coming out of the past three years, it's been a little rough for everyone. Um, I think that we need to remember that when we come into church on Sundays. 
So our outpouring of the Holy Spirit could help someone that's fighting um, a private battle or going through their own spiritual desert and help bring them, um, bring life to that dry ground. Um, and then also we need to remember that just as it's not Derek's duty to fill us up with the word, it's not Jason and the worship team's duty to fill us up for the week with our worship. The worship team's job is to help uh, facilitate worship and set the atmosphere so that we may receive what God has for us and through, sorry, I wrote really small here, uh, and transform us, transform our lives through the word, sorry. Had terrible chicken scratch right there. Um, and I think that we need to remember that, you know, just in the Lord's Prayer, it's thank you for this daily bread. It's not weekly bread. Um, I think that we need to constantly fill ourselves on a daily basis and not just expect them to pull all the weight for us. Um, as in Hebrews 10, 25, uh, it talks about how... <clears throat> um, to call, it's the call to preserve the faith. Um, I'm going to actually start in verse 24, chapter 10. It says, And let us consider how we may spur one another toward love and good deeds, not giving up on meeting together, as some of us are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see on the day approaching. It's actually, as we see in the letter to Hebrews, it's, it's not... Um, it's not Christian-like to skip out on worship and being in a public sense of worship. Um, and then this, this one was really good in the book. It says that we can't persuade ourselves to that we meet together with other Christians when by electronic means we watch the worship elsewhere. I think that if your kids are sick, if you're not feeling the best if you just went through a surgery or maybe you just have a tough time getting out of the house for closing or for injury reasons yeah there's great assets and uses for online worship but has it become a crutch over the last three years for some people as an excuse to not come and publicly worship with us and commune with us and guess what covid's over it's time to come back to church um I think that also we see that Jesus participated in both public and private worship. Uh, publicly in Luke 4.16, he goes to the synagogue on uh, the Sabbath day and he actually reads uh, there. And then we also see that Jesus privately goes into worship in Luke 5.15 where he's seen, um, he's overwhelmed by the crowd and he actually it just, I, I love how Luke puts this. Let me get to it really fast. Starting in, in 515, he says, Yet the news about him spread all the more, so the crowds of people came near to him, or came to hear him and to be healed of their sickness. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Because Jesus shows us that at those times when he's constantly pouring out that he has to withdraw himself because he is man. He's fully man, but fully God. That he has to withdraw to also become and increase that relationship with his father and become filled up so he can pour out his spirit to others. Um, I think that just as things, um, just as there's things that we can't get from public worship, you can't get privately and vice versa. I think that there's advantages to both but I think that they are one and the same. I think that you need to have that private relationship as well as the public relationship. Um, it's all about balance. Just I, I, That's what I, one of the main themes that I saw through this chapter is it's all about balance. It's spirit and truth. It's public and private. It's, you know, both things um, equally balanced out. And also there's this great quote from Jeffrey Thomas in the chapter that says that there's no way that those who neglect secret worship can know communion with God in the public services of the Lord's day. So just remember that what, how we praise and worship privately is reflected on Sunday. 
Um, I think that this is one of those, uh, we get to see through the Holy Spirit who's actually kindling that fire throughout the week and, you know, who's just putting on a show publicly. Um, I think that it's a challenge I, and, I, and I challenge myself with this. Is it, it, am I filling myself up or am I just putting on a, um, putting on a front, I guess, on, on Sunday. So um, just because someone raises their hands during worship doesn't make them more anointed than you as long as you are joyfully worshiping the Lord. Um, for example, I'm not the best singer and Andrea can attest to that. Um, but I do it joyfully on Sundays. And um, I think that that's ultimately what God wants is he just wants us joyfully. Um, also, like, I just want to commend also some people in the choir for like the way that they pour out praise amanda especially i always see you on sunday you do a great job worshiping um and i think that that's just a reflection of that private life is just what i covered it's just like you can see on their faces those people that are carrying that well that they have so much in their cup that they want to share it with everyone and i think that that's where we all need to focus on being a little bit better myself included um, and then, um, I think that what that quote was getting at was that you can see some people whose spiritual fires are stoked over the week privately versus the ones that are coming on, on one ember, barely lit from the week before. Um, so I just think that that's one of those things that we need to, we can all work on. Um, and then the last point is worship is a discipline to be cultivated. Um, it requires a discipline just like anything we do on a daily basis. Um, you know, when I got into, um, I was raised Methodist, kind of was a Super Bowl Christian. My parents did not take us very often. Sports ruled our household, unfortunately. Um, and as I got into college, sports continued to be the forefront of my life, being a athlete at Ole Miss and everything. But um, I started to go on my journey myself. And I think that when I first went to FCA, I felt like I was an imposter. I had a real imposter syndrome that I was not on the level of some of these Christians that I saw. And I think that that's where, you know, you just got to realize it's just like any other sport or any other thing that we do in our lives that we're not going to be pros at it. Um, so it's just about starting, you know, it's about that journey of 10,000 steps, you know, starts with one step. And I think that, um, you know, it's just that that's where we got to start. And I think that that's where Psalm 98, four, um, comes into play. Let me flip to it really quick. Um, Psalm 98, four says shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth burst into jubilant song with music. So I think that, <coughs> You just got to start somewhere. And, you know, just like I'm not going to be able to head out the door and expect to run a sub three hour marathon, we need to build up into it. Um, but spending time with God privately will help build that relationship to be able to praise him publicly. And, um, and I think that it requires us to fully focus and respond to God. And I think that also if you struggle or like you don't know where to get started, it's great to have a mentor. I mean, the there's so many times that Paul talks about mentoring and even all of his letters to the different churches in the New Testament show that he was trying to mentor them to bring them up. So I think that getting under someone that has a better prayer life, has a better worship life, any of these disciplines that we've been talking about over the past couple of weeks I think that if you say, hey, I'm lacking there, finding a mentor, it's okay to ask for help. You know, we're all still learning on a daily basis. I think that there's, we all carry unique gifts. Um, the Holy Spirit, that's one of the great things and the ways that God made us is that we're both, we're all, you know, beautifully and wonderfully made and that the Holy Spirit all lives within us and that the Holy Spirit endows us with certain gifts and some people may be stronger in worship and some may, people may be huge theologians. Um, and I think that that's where 
getting under someone's mentorship and then eventually mentoring someone else builds that future generation and create can create us can build us into a stronger church and community um so i'm going to pose a question to you guys at the end um just to take as we we leave is uh we worship so many worldly things so why do we have such a hard time worshiping the, our creator and that's just something to think about because in the in the end of the chapter i think that he puts it so beautifully is that you have to think of in Andrea and I have been rewatching The Chosen, and um, it's a great series. And I think that when you're thinking about everyone that was following Jesus and the disciples over those three years, um, they were just hoping for just one look from Jesus. And how he puts it is, can you imagine being one of those people following and giving your life to him? And then the disciple comes up to you and says, hey, guess what? Jesus wants to talk to you. And you guys can talk about anything you want for however long you want and anytime you want for the rest of eternity. They would be overwhelmed. They would be jumping with joy. And we get that opportunity every single day, but what do we get distracted by? I know I personally get distracted by a lot of things. And I know that starting out, even spending five minutes with God was difficult for me. But now I think that the more it's it's this beautiful cycle that the more that you long for him and get into his word, the more you crave it. And just like we talked about last week, that that longing to devour it and to consume it and it becomes an all consuming fire. And it's and that's that Holy Spirit inside of you. It's just that thirst. Um, so. Questions, comments, concerns. So many of us, so many of us worship our work, work hard at our play, and play at our worship. Exactly. And I'm just thinking, and then it went back to the beginning and said, if we're not thinking about God, we're not worshiping. Yep. I mean, if we're not thinking about, we can sing all we want to and praise and do whatever, but if we're not thinking about God, mm -hmm. At that time, we're not worshiping. Yeah. Those two things really stuck. Yeah. I, I think for me, um, with private and public worship, sometimes one leads my life and sometimes the other. An example of that is sometimes my private worship helps me pay attention to the public worship. Mm -hmm. You know, it gets the clutter out of the way. Yeah. And then I can focus. Um, but sometimes um, the public worship kind of is the capstone. It's when you read a book and there's all these plots going on, you get to the last chapter and everything ties together. Sometimes public worship does that for me. And I guess the third way is sometimes I need public worship to energize me for my yep. private worship going forward. So kind of mm -hmm. different ways in my life they, they interact. Yeah, that's awesome. And I mean, uh, that's perfectly put. I mean, I... I don't have anything more than that. That's awesome. I love that. That was a great illustration of it. Anyone else? No. Well, I'll close this out in prayer. Um, also, just thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. It was awesome. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, just Lord, thank you for this. Thank you for this ability for us to meet and to worship you and to talk about worshiping you um i just pray that we can all that we all hopefully glean something off of this and that we can take it into our private lives that will help us grow publicly as well and that ultimately we will grow to just shout your name in your name we pray amen, amen. and on that note real quick also thank you <laughs> on that note Choir practice does start in 11 minutes. I know that they're looking for new people, so anyone feeling <laughs> led to praise and worship?
Jason yeah. and Kim will take your uh, registration. <laughs> yeah. Very good segue. Very good.